special welcome you for being here. Tonight's program is going to be the usual format. We're going to have 30 minutes of a talk from Nick, and then we're going to have 30 minutes of Q&A. Uh, from the audience, we'll have live questions, and you can also tweet us using the hashtag um, ASOSIMPERIAL. Um, those questions will be after the talk, as I said. So on to our speaker for tonight. Um, I know a lot of us are excited about this. Um, Nick Robertson co-founded ASOS in 2000. His career began in 1987 at the advertising agency Young and Rubicon. In 1991, he moved to Carrot, the UK's largest media planning and buying agency. In 1995, he then co-founded Entertainment Marketing, a marketing services business. And in addition to all of this, Nick was awarded an OBE in 2011 for his achievements in the world of fashion and retailing. So please join me in welcoming Nick to the stage. Thank you. Everybody hear me in the back? Yes. Yeah. So, um, well, thank you very much for inviting me. Very kind. I do uh, I do this for a couple of reasons. One, because um, I never went to university. I got a D and an E at A level and um, never kind of made any heights of uh, further education. So it kind of makes me feel a bit better to sit in an auditorium uh, or a lecture theatre. And the other thing is, um, you know, hopefully a lot of you are our customers and I don't get to meet many customers being online only business. So there's kind of two ways through here. I'll tell you about us and hopefully you'll be able to give me a bit of feedback. Um, at the end about what we're doing right or, or wrong. So I'm going to spend, talk about half an hour. I mean, really, the, the best thing I can do is, is kind of talk you through the journey, which, um, to be honest, in many parts, you couldn't really make it up. Um, it's been a hell of a journey we've had for kind of 10, 12 years, and, and quite an um, um, you know, extraordinary one for, for many ways. So I'm just going to talk you through that. And then I'll talk you through um, some of the things I've kind of uh, learned along the way, which, uh, believe me, I've been uh, in this newfangled world that we're operating in. And then, uh, sort of, you know, the serious stuff, then we'll save that for the Q&A, and please feel free to kind of ask me anything. So, let me just sort of go back in time. We were, uh, as the speaker said, we were, we were running a, a marketing business, uh, and effectively, it was product placement. So, you've probably heard of that. That's, that's kind of putting, you know, brands into TV programs and films. Um, you know, the UK is okay at it. I mean, obviously, the main market for that is in the US, where we'll be big movies are made. So we were sort of bumbling along in the UK, we had a nice little business, it was doing all right, we had sort of brands like Pepsi and Carlberg and stuff, and we were putting those brands into the TV programs. So that was kind of the late 90s, um, sort of 96, 97, 98. And then the internet was just starting to kind of, uh, you know, come on our, our radar. Amazon had obviously launched in 97. Um, and, you know, we thought, well, hold on, how can we use this sort of internet thing alongside our marketing business? Um, so at that point in time, there was no aspiration to be, you know, a retailer, and no aspiration to be, a, uh, you know, a fashion business. So any sort of budding entrepreneurs out there, you know, you really don't have to have had the experience in the space uh, before you go out there and do it. So we were literally a market business, and looking at the internet and how we could use the internet to um, sort of further that business. So that's where the as seen on screen. I don't know if everybody knew what ASOS stood for. So we originally called as seen on screen .com. We bought as seen on screen back then for 50 quid. Uh, and we set up this website. Now, now, I'll talk about various bits of good luck along the way, and the first bit of good luck, um, so A, we were able to buy our scene on screen for 50 quid, nobody bought that, so that was a domain that we were able to get quite cheaply. Um, and my brother at the time uh, had also done some internet stuff um, with a company called Free Pages, or Scoot, I don't know if anybody remembers that, but they were one of the early websites. So he knew some people who could build websites, which sounds ridiculous now, but believe me, back then, 97, 98, 99, you know, there weren't that many people who could build websites. So all the early internet adopters, like ourselves, had to build our own, uh, which is a fundamental difference. Now you can just go and buy all this stuff off the shelf, and you know, developers are, I'd love to say to a penny, but they're not, but, you know, they're certainly not as rare as they were back then. So to have somebody who actually knew how to code and build a website back then uh, was a major benefit. So we knew a couple of guys, and they started to build this as seen on screen.com website. So the idea, because we were marketing people, was saying, right, you know, could you could you create a website where you type in a film name or a program name and up would come the brands that appeared within it? Now we were the marketing people, so we thought that would be a benefit. So if you typed in Mission Impossible, you know, up, up would come the kind of Oakley sunglasses that Tom Cruise was wearing in the film. So we thought customers would want to know what they were, you know, what they were. And actually there's lots of research about product placement. There was a you know, lamp that appeared in one episode of Friends and apparently NBC broadcast got like 28,000 calls because you know, viewers wanted to know where that lamp was from and where they could get it. So we knew there was demand for that. Um, so we built the website and we started putting this stuff on it as a kind of you know, showcase for brands and trying to then persuade brands to pay us 
to be on this website. But of course, you know, back then there was no traffic, nobody had heard of us, brands certainly hadn't heard of us, so we were, we were kind of pushing all uphill. So about sort of six months into that journey, we said, well, you know, there's no way we can monetize that. The only way we can actually make money from this website, bearing in mind we had this other little marketing business funneling along, uh, was to sell the Oakley sunglasses. So we started sort of just buying stuff, and literally we weren't buying it in a way a retailer would buy it from wholesale. We would go and buy stuff full price from the store, put it on this website, and put a markup on it. And I don't know if people remember that band All Saints with uh, Nicole Appleton and people like that. I mean, they, they came out wearing like uh, Burberry headscarves, and we would literally go down to Burberry, we'd buy 10 of them, and we'd go back and photograph them, put them on the website, and sort of double the price and sell them. I mean, that's how sort of basic it was. Um, <laughs> So, so we had this sort of marketing business and this little website called Asseen on screen that, that, that weirdly started getting a bit of press as well because A, we were sort of one of the early adopters and B, you know, the whole principle of sort of having a, uh, a sort of celebrity and a product and a kind of as seen on, get the look, all that kind of stuff was actually quite relevant at the time. Uh, and weirdly, in hindsight, it's now obvious, but back then we were combining two things that had never been combined before. If you think about the old world of media and certainly fashion media so media was all about inspiration you know you'd buy Vogue you'd buy Elle to get inspired as to what you should be buying and then you'd have to jump to another world of retail now that could be a shop or whatever to buy it and you know historically those two worlds had never you know been together so you had inspiration by the media companies and you had retailers on, on the other side and brand so if you think about a web page that was the first time you could have the inspiration layer i.e. the picture of the celebrity and the product with a buy button which is now obvious to all of us, but back then, you know, that hadn't been done. So again, that was the sort of thing that started getting people interested in, in what we were doing. So this as seen on screen .com, did anybody actually buy from it when it was called as seen on screen? God, we got one. Thank you for being honest. Um, okay, so we were, you know, it wasn't fashion back then. It was, you know, it was an eclectic bunch of, you know, like Jamie Oliver's Pestle and Mortar. We had the frame, the frame for the back of the door in Friends. You know, it was that whole sort of as seen on screen film sort of connection. So then, the second bit of luck we had was that when we started selling a bit more stuff, we thought, well, hold on, we probably need to employ somebody who actually knows what they're talking about. So we were told by an agency that we needed something called a buyer. Now, anybody who worked in retail knows that buyers are, but we didn't know about that. So, so we, we interviewed for a buyer, uh, and the bit of luck was that the first person who we interviewed, uh, obviously we had an extensive interview process, the first person we interviewed was a lady called Laurie Penn, who happened to be at Stop Shop. So Laurie arrived at, as seen on screen. She was buying all this other stuff that you know, we were telling her to buy. But she would then start going down to Great Portland Street, which is just around the corner, uh, and she would come back with bags of clothes. Because that was her world. She'd operate in Topshop, where you could effectively do that. Great Portland Street, and, you know, it's just full of wholesalers. So you could literally go down there and come back with bags of clothes. So she would put more clothes on the website. The margin on these clothes obviously better than anything else we were selling before. And we would literally shoot it on a, you know, a girl in the office. We'd superimpose somebody else's head using Photoshop. Uh, and we would start selling these clothes. And you know, back then, that was kind of the heat and Now magazine when you know, they were in their heyday. And that whole sort of get the lure in the style of uh, you know, was, was kind of prevalent. So, so we started selling sort of more clothes than, than anybody else. Um, I mean, I can give you some. Uh, right, what are the examples? Um, oh, this is the funny one. So this one you really couldn't make up. So, so the Matrix was out, and Laurie said, look, you know, that, that coat, that long black coat that Keanu Reeves wears, you know, we think we could sell a few of those. So, so we actually made, at the time, it was like huge, it was like 50% of our stock we tied up in making these like 100 Matrix coats, big wool black coat. And then we got a bit wobbly, we thought, oh my God, it's so obvious that it's a, you know, it's a Matrix. Um, we better write to the studio and just see if we can get permission. So we thought we'd write to them, you know, let her and say, can we sell these matrix codes, give you a license fee, and off you'll go. And about two weeks later, this is back in the days of snail mail, we got a letter back, and uh, they said, look, you know, under normal circumstances, would be fine. And unfortunately, it's just come at a time when uh, a student, funny enough, had gone into a campus in the States and had a big black coat with a shotgun. And I think some people had died. So this whole big black coat thing was not kind of what they wanted. So we went, oh, God. So now we had like these hundred big black coats all for all made. And like, we couldn't sell them. What the hell do we do with that? So, so I remember, we went to the warehouse, there was a tiny little warehouse at the time, we literally just hung them up in the rafters to kind of get them out of the way so they weren't clogging up space so we could. And we stared at these things for six months. I remember he was looking at me in shock and said the true story. And, um, and literally, it took us six months and somebody just said, you know those black coats? And, yeah, you know we were going to sell them as matrix coats? Yeah, why don't you just sell them as black coats? <laughs> 
What a great idea. <laughs> so literally, the background of the rafters on the shell, you know, on the website, it's just a black coat. No matrix, <laughs> matrix or anything. Yeah, it was out of the way. So that was one of the funny stories. Um, the other one was, um, and actually, before, when we were doing sort of mix of fashion, other thing. Anybody remember there's a BT commercial uh, which had a, a chameleon phone? Remember that? Call the chameleon? Anybody? They did. Uh, anyway, that culture, so, uh, culture club song, but this kind of comedian comes up on the, on the anyway. So that was one of the products we sold, because uh, it was as seen on screen. And we remember a uh, big order we made before Christmas. Christmas was a huge time for retailers. And the supplier let us down at the last minute, and, um, uh, and, and the product didn't arrive. So I thought, oh my God. And we'd taken all this money, we were kind of taking pre orders And actually, if I look back, that saved us, because we took everybody's money pre Christmas. That kind of got us through the creep Christmas pee. Eventually the phones turned up, so we sent everybody the phone, and then so many were faulty that they kind of, about 40, 50% of them came back, which is an absolute disaster. But literally that sort of inflow of cash at that time, and the outflow just about kind of bundled us through that Christmas where we were already. So the little things like that along the journey of... Um, so then, uh, so the luck was we knew, we knew how to build a website. The other bit of luck was we employed the first girl who was from Topshop, who started sort of nudging us towards this kind of more fashion than, than anything else. Um, and then, weirdly, uh, <coughs> another bit of major luck. So, does anybody remember the uh, Bunsfield fuel depot explosion? <laughs> so, it was kind of, Bunsfield was out near Hemel Hempstead, uh, and there's the Europe's biggest fuel depot out there. We didn't actually know. Uh, and this fuel depot supplies all the airports, it's got pipes going down to like, Heathrow and stuff. Uh, and our warehouse was about 500 yards away from that. We didn't even know that depot existed. That was at the end of the road. I've never gone down the end of the road because we literally, the, the, the warehouse was on the main road. So we turned off the main road and went to our warehouse. We never went further down that road to see what was down there. Anyway, one Sunday morning in December 2005 now, uh, this fuel depot exploded. And, um, and that was our warehouse. So that wasn't a great December, right in the middle of the kind of Christmas rush. Um, Weirdly, I'll tell you a bit about the explosion. So, so an explosion is just like, like nobody died, thank God, but imagine a, a rush of air. So, so the first warehouse next to the fuel depot was absolutely flattened. The one after that was kind of leaning at 45 degrees. And our warehouse, we were like number three down, was still standing. It was like, oh my God, this is fantastic. You know, doing a couple of days without business. Anyway, eventually they let us back in and we were sort of walking around. It wasn't very big, it's probably, I don't know, four times the size of this room. And, uh, and we were sort of crunching on the floor and going, what's all that? And we looked up and basically but the explosion had come in, blown down two loading bay doors that way, uh, shot out the other loading bay doors that way. So you had loading bay doors in that way and the other out that way. The weirdest thing you've ever seen. That kind of, but the whole roof had lifted up like five feet and come crashing down again. So, so all these things that we were treading on were the rivets from the roof that had come off. So it was like, oh. God, and then the health and safety guy said, look, you can't possibly, you know, operate out here for at least six weeks while we rebuild, rebuild all of that. So that was December 2005 when we were offline for the best part of six weeks. And normally, any other retailer, that probably would have been uh, game over again. But weirdly, um, two things happened. One, because we were the last building standing, the press used our car park as like where they based themselves. And because journos are inherently lazy, journos in the room? They don't like to travel too far. ASOS, what I seen on screen back then, was the story that they all wrote about. So we had all these you know, poor businesses that were completely out of, out of business because their warehouse had collapsed. And we were the one, everybody was going, you know, ASOS rises from the ashes. And, you know, it was a, it was a um, uh, BBC disaster master program. They did a whole like, 40 minute time time BBC One on how ASOS couldn't make it up. So out of that tragedy, we got more publicity than you could shake a stick at, which kind of put us on the map again. And then weirdly, because we're an online business, if you think about it, every single customer that ever interacted with us for five years, we had the detail. So we could tell them exactly what had happened. We told the 18,000 customers whose orders we couldn't fulfill that weekend because you know we were blown up. They totally understood it. It's all over the news. So we were able to communicate with them directly. We told them, look, guys, we're going to be back soon. By the way, we're going to have a big sale because you know we need to clear all this stuff. And the day we came back, six weeks later, we had our biggest trading day ever. And never looked back. So if you, if you go into a world of, you know, thank God we were an online business rather than an offline business, because we had every single customer's data, uh, we were able to kind of keep the loop. So that was kind of 2005. Um, what a funny story. So, so the, the business kind of kept 
building, and we could see that you know every day was bigger than the previous day, we were bigger than the previous week, um, and you know we were looking around, getting inspiration from the lines of Amazon, who just kept filling up their shop. You know, we could see them adding more products, we could see them adding more categories, and we were a sort of fashion business. And, and when I tell people now, we were sort of we were solving a very different problem. You know, and, and people sort of trying to understand why 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 didn't other people join this party? You know, why, why you know if, if um, Selfridges or you know Harvey Nicks had got their act together, why would we need to exist? Why would Ned Porte need to exist? And that's a really interesting one, actually. You know, we, we asked ourselves why why are the, why are the department stores not doing this? And when the answer came back to me, it was so obvious. It wasn't. Everybody says, well, they probably you know they didn't think you know luxury goods would work online, or they were too sniffy about their brand, or you know they wanted the in-store experience, all that kind of stuff. And all those may be valid points. But the reason department stores didn't do it quick enough or early enough is if you think about what they are, they're just buildings. Selfridges is just a big building. It's a beautiful building, but it doesn't actually own any of the product that it sells in its building. At some point in its history, it became a landlord. It rents out its space to the brand. So, you know, what was a very clever model at the time, because it didn't need to buy stock or any of the inherent risks about, you know, being a retailer, it just kind of let it out its space to the brand. The internet came along and they're suddenly going, we as Selfridges don't actually have anything to put online. It was, it was that phenomenon that enabled the likes of Nether Porte and for us to um, kind of create a business. So that's kind of 2004, 2005. I mean, the ASOS came about just literally because we were calling it ASOS internally. Uh, abbreviating it that way, we kind of we could never envisage a shop. And back then, we were even thinking about maybe we need a shop. We'd kind of have seen on the screen above it. That wouldn't make sense. So we just we just kind of changed the name to ASOS. And I remember buying ASOS.com off some reach app, I think it was, uh, about five hundred dollars, which was expensive at the time, but now seems like a, a bit of a bargain. Um, <laughs> and, and and the kind of the rest sort of went from there. So then. Then we kind of go, well, what, you know, why do we, why do we stick to fashion? Why do we stick to young fashion? All that kind of thing. So, so really, it's it's become sort of quite straightforward now that the the fashion side of things seem to do better than all the other bits and pieces we were we were operating in. And I said we were solving a different problem. We were trying to we were trying to get more fashion in front of our customers. Where if you think about brands, they're just trying to promote their brand, or you know, a fashion retailer is trying to promote their store. Whereas we were the internet, and actually, it was just obvious from us day one that actually, when customers arrive at a website, they want the choice of everything. You know, you want to go to a website, and actually, we do you a disservice if we haven't got the brand that you're looking for. So, if you think about the problem we were trying to solve, it was totally different. And you know, it's been a journey getting all those brands on board. It starts with the sort of perhaps not so trendy ones, and you start to move up the food chain, and a bit like Domino's, once you get sort of one, then another one wants to come in, and you, you sort of gradually move forward. So, even, you know, most of the brands we've now got that we would want, the ones interestingly that we haven't, the ones that we would love or like to top shop or things like that, um, you know, that's a different story because sort of Arcadia and us are, are sort of enemies in the world of fashion retailing now. So if you think about it, we've employed about 1,100, 1,200 people and a big chunk of those have come from Arcadia and Topshop. So that's always been the sort of slight hand between our, our two businesses. But other than that, I think most of the brands that, that you know, 20-somethings would, would want to buy, um, they're on there. And then you go, well, why, why do you just do 20-somethings? And, and I've lost count of how many people said, you know, but Nick, surely when they get to 30 and 40, wouldn't you want to keep them? I go, well, yeah, but a fashion brand, if you think about it, doesn't generally have a very long shelf life. You, know, you think about a young fashion brand that's lasted for more than 15, 20 years. Actually, they're very few. And the ones that do are the ones that absolutely rigid, religiously stick to their knitting. You know, as soon as you start to grow old with your customer, or as soon as mum and daughter appear to be shopping in the same space, then you know, sooner or later, one of others is going to stop doing it. So you have to absolutely stay true to, to who you are. And you know, part of our inspiration for doing what we've done, going back to that days of kind of combining media inspiration with retail, is that actually the brands that do endure in the fashion world are media brands. Think about the likes of their own, you know, they've been around for hundreds of years. So actually, can we be the new media in the world of fashion for our kind of 20-something customer group? That's, that's how we think about it. Can we give you that inspirational layer next to the buy button and the product? And if we can combine both of those things in the same place, then we think that feels like a more um, enduring strategy for us. And then you can overlay things like the free living, free returns. Well, you know, that's what you want. You know, I'd love to be able to charge you for delivery. And I'd love to be able to charge you for return. And, you know, 
did you know that 35% of all of our products that go out come back again? You know, these are huge numbers for it. Our free delivery globally costs us the best part of 100 odd million pounds, you know, straight off the bottom line in terms of free delivery. But that's what you want. You know, that's the world we've got to operate in. And I suppose our mantra has always been, you know, build what the customer wants and try and let their sort of business way work out the kind of profit number at the bottom of it. And I think businesses that kind of start with the customer first, you know, generally have a more enduring uh, strategy. So now roll forward 2005, 2006, 2010, you know, those, those are big milestones. And then, and then you know, we were a very UK-centric business, but because we were in online, we were getting orders from all around the world. And suddenly Australia went from nowhere to you know, maybe 10, 15% of our business overnight. So effectively, we just followed the pound as well. If you think about traditional retail, you have to almost kind of buy the stock, that's a cost. You have to go in and lease a store, that's a cost. You have to staff that store, that's a cost. You've got all the other bits and pieces associated with it before you've even sold a single dress. <coughs> Whereas we sit there with a dress in Barnsley and a website you know, based in London and we can sell dresses to Australia. So in terms of internationalizing, there's no expense to that. So all that comes is you see where the pound's going and then you start to put in a little bit of infrastructure around that. So globally now, we have a few offices scattered around the world, a small amount of people in them. We have a few kind of distribution centers and returns hubs now where we can get to the parcel a little bit quicker to you around the world. But that's it. In terms of kind of capital required to internationalize your business, it's absolutely, absolutely tiny. And our international is about 60% of, of our business. And the other interesting stat which forced it was that actually, you know, I think it's something like 3% of the world's 20-somethings, you know, kind of, or internet savvy 20 somethings are based in the UK and actually when the rest of the world really turns the lights on, that's going to be less than 1%. So in terms of the opportunity that is ASOS on a global fashion scale, uh, the, you know, the huge opportunity for us really is outside of the UK. So that's it and sort of roll it forward now. I mean, we, you know, big milestone for me was kind of the billion of sales. So we did that, well, near as damn it last year. If we hadn't had another fire, we seem to be a bit fire prone on winning house sadly. Um, but we had another little fire in the, in the summer which, uh, which lost us a bit of business, but um, so we got to our kind of billion last year, which um, in retail sales terms, that's about 1.3, 1.4 billion of sales through the tills. I mean, you take off the BAT and you take off the return, you get to, to about a billion. So that was a big milestone, but I think actually the, the kind of the, the scale of the opportunity uh, is significantly bigger than that. I mean, you take the likes of Zara, Inditex, H&M, global fashion brands, um, you know, you don't have to be the biggest in every market, but when you add up all the markets together, it's a very big number. So I think, you know, Zara brand alone turns over nearly sort of 10 billion. So it puts it into the concept of the scale of the, the opportunity. So that's where we are, we are today. I mean, I think, um, you know, what, what's changing, and, and like any business, you, you've got to keep evolving. And if I, you know, if you told me five years ago that 30% of our sales would be on a mobile device five years later, I would have laughed. You know, I came from a era where, where people were struggling to get the concept of buying clothes without going into a store. The fact that now 30% of that is coming through the mobile device is just staggering. That's how quickly the world is, you know, this world is moving, and how quickly we need to keep evolving the proposition. And that's going to lead to all different kind of issues. You know, it's, it's quite well documented. You know, Google have been a phenomenal business over the last 15 or so years, but actually, mobile could be their death. You know, you don't need Google in the mobile world. You know, you, you don't need um, search in a mobile world. So you know, even the mighty Google will struggle in the next kind of five, ten years. And it's a store that's, that's, that's had, you know, best part of 65, 70,000 products on it, which on a big screen is quite easy to navigate. Going through that in some kind of mobile device is going to be increasingly hard. So there's lots of challenges we're going to have. You know, how do we flush up 65,000, 70,000 products to you in one go? Well, we can't. You know, we've, we've got to we've got to be putting product in front of you that's really, really relevant to you. Now, that could be that could be algorithms in the back working out what you've looked at, what you say, what you bought. You know, or it could be you know making it easy for your friends to suggest stuff to you. Um, you know, all the kind of social aspects of the social. We're, we're going to have to be flushing up. You know, it could be what your stylist has suggested, or it could be the the product your the stylist that you're following is suggesting you look at. You know, all the ways we're going to have to be a lot smarter about how we flush product up to you and, and what you've got. So, in terms of our strategy for the future, you know, we kind of three big words. It's absolutely about globalization, um, personalization, and mobilization. You know, if we stick to those three things, you can see how that will hopefully put us in good stead. So, I think that's pretty much it. I could talk all night about anecdotes and various bits and pieces, but you know, I suppose, I suppose the, the, the takeout for me, having, having done this for as long as we have, um, 
you know, you don't have to set out to be something to where you end up. You know, it is a journey, you know, and I think a lot of people, a lot of people don't get the first rung on the journey because they're trying to overthink where it's going to end up. You know, look at us. We started out as a, as a small marketing business and ended up as one of the sort of UK's, if not world's, biggest online fashion retailers. You know, where you start and where you finish are two very, very different things. The key to that is, you know, a couple of things. Stay flexible. You know, don't be so set in your ways that you, you, you don't follow you know, ultimately where the pound is going. And a wise man once said to me, you know, Nick, you're, you're much better off having a little percentage of something big. You know, when we stumbled into fashion retailing, only because we'd employed somebody from Topshop, you know, what we, what we unwittingly found ourselves in is a huge market. You know, the, the fashion industry in the UK is alone, it's about 40 billion. So, you know, getting a little piece of something big is ultimately going to be a much bigger business than trying to get 100% of what is a small space. And, you know, if your biggest commodity as an individual, the person, is the hours you've got in the day, which, you know, even the, even the most budding entrepreneurs will only work 18, 20 hours a day, you know, if you're going to spend your 18, 20 hours a day working, make sure you're doing it in a big space where the reward is, you know, sufficient. Don't keep battling away from people. And then, um, the other wise words were, and this, um, you know, and I hear it all too often, and, you know, we never set out to do this. We never set out to build, to sell. And I hear so many people, especially today, and I think it's, a, a, you know, it's cheap money, and it's everybody seems to sort of financially engineer it. I mean, you know, if you're building a business because you want to flip it and sell it, you know, you don't deserve the business. You know, you've got to build a business on what is, tr what is building true value for customers. And do you know what? In time, that will pay you far greater reward. And that's always kind of been our, our mantra. Build a business that you know, genuinely makes a fundamental difference to people in the long term. Don't do it in a, in a kind of short-term way. And then you know, as, as entrepreneurs, there's a lot of pushback at us. Is, you know, you, if, even if you build something, you sell out too quick. You, know, you are the person that drove it. You are the person that created it. You, know, you are the, the lifeblood of that business. You know, why would you just let somebody else take that on? You know, if you love it that much, you should, you should keep building it. You know, I've been doing it for 15 years, and, and I'd hope, you know, in some capacity, to still be involved in the business for a very long time. Can I stay at the helm, running it, slogging it day in, day out? No, you'd want, you know, fresh blood to come through. But do you want to be involved in the business? Absolutely. So, you know, if you ever get to a point, have the words in your head. You know, don't sell too soon. I think you'll, you'll miss out. Okay. Thank you very much. Like I said earlier, we're going to have time for some questions now. Um, I've seen some of you have sent in some tweets uh, with some questions now, which is great. If you come up with any of the discussion goes, then uh, just let me know. Um, there are some questions already here for you, and you haven't had much of a time to rest your voice. Uh, we can get going, if that's okay. The first is coming in is asking um, a bit more about the delivery and return service, which you touched upon. Uh, so how can ASOS afford to provide free delivery and returns, and how does that work over the past few years? Well, go back to my, we've got to make it work. So, you know, with scale, you get lots of leverage in other areas. So, you know, we're not big on marketing. Ironically, some other big businesses spend more on that. So, you know, the guy at Amazon actually kind of gave us the, the inclination all those years ago. Delivery, free delivery, free return is in our hands a marketing spend. The thing that's going to get any customer to order more frequently is free delivery, free return. No amount of marketing, no amount of flag waving, no amount of magazine ad. You know, if you've got free delivery, free return, that's the best bit of marketing you can possibly do. So we've always attributed that, you know, the investment there as marketing spend. And how's that been a part of the business from day one? Um, no, it was, uh, I think we introduced it in about 2005, 2006. You know, we could see where the market was going, actually in a highly competitive market. And in fashion, where the margins are such that there's quite a lot to play for, uh, I think it's greedy of a business to not offer that. Mm -hmm. Another question is coming here um, about smart clothes. So it says, smart clothes and wearables are starting to make their way into fashion. What's your opinion on the hype that's surrounding this? So, forgive me if I don't know all of the information. You know, 3D printing for fashion, long way off. I mean, what I've seen, where that's, you know, what the capabilities are there, uh, certainly in the short to medium term, nothing that you know, any fashion lover around this room would, would probably want to uh, wear with comfort, should we say. Um, and then, you know, do, do I get everything around your wrist to then be the next generation of foam? Yes, absolutely. And this one here is a bit more of a, a personal one. Um, asking, you've had, you know, obviously, I mentioned a long, illustrious career, but what's been the biggest obstacle in, in your career, and how have you overcome that? Uh, well, I mean, it, it, it's 
star one, but actually people are the hardest thing. Um, and knowing good people and knowing bad people and knowing when to get good people and when to overpay for people and when to let go of people who, you know, it's, it's a very fluid, and, and when a business is growing very quickly, you know, people that are attracted to a company called As Seen on Screen turning over five billion pounds are very different to people you need running ASOS turning over a billion. Um, you know, and you want to try and keep as much of the kind of DNA entrepreneurial spirit in there, but there are certain skills that, that are just required to run a, run a bigger business. And I think, you know, I've, I've always been quite good at delegating. Um, that's quite key. You know, it's a bit like a you know chameleon or snake, but keep shedding your skin because if you don't, you're going to restrict the size of the business. Um, and you know, I suppose as I alluded to right at the beginning, having not been to university, you know, I'm very aware there are considerably brighter people around than me. So why wouldn't you want to surround yourself by them? And there's one here asking, what is your sustainability strategy at ASOS? Sustainability. Well, um, so so I think there's lots of different facets in that. If we go back to the the manufacturing side of things, I think. Um, you know, that, that's, that's a global issue, um, and you know we are absolutely not pitched at the kind of value value end. So Porsche is already a kind of a, a, a layer in there from a threshold perspective. We know that if we're manufacturing somewhere where it is child labour or blown in way, you know, that that would be an issue. So so where we're pitched in terms of price point, certainly for our own brand, that shouldn't be that shouldn't be an issue. I mean, I have spoken to people who are in that space, and you know it's a real dilemma. Um, I get annoyed with people who sit in ivory towers in London, you know, saying you shouldn't be doing that when actually you know, that equals a complete livelihood for certain people around the world. So I think you've got to be very careful. It's easy to kind of you know, throw um, generalisations at that. Um, I mean, things that I love that are more sustainable. So um, you know, ASOS Marketplace now. You know, if, if we go to how how you know the so bastions of big business are starting to diminish and, and things like Marketplace and Amazon approved it, you know, if you've got a talent and you've got a product, well, you can put your product in front of millions of people, um, you know, in a way that you just could never have done before. So, sort of, is it sustainability or is it opportunity for more people on an ongoing basis? You know, I, I think that's, that's key in that packaging. Okay, brilliant. I think um, I'll open it up to the floor now so you can not just hear my voice, um, but I want to hear from you guys. I wanted to make a request that if you could um, just stand up before you ask a question and just speak really clearly so everyone can hear you. Um, so yeah, at the front, please. Please, yeah, if yeah, everyone might hear from me. Yeah, that, that's an interesting one because you know, mm -hmm. arguably you could say we are, you know, we, we got there early, which is a real benefit, uh, and I, I'm not I'm not detracting away from that. I think you know, being being early as we were certainly helped us. I think when you roll the sort of get the crystal ball out and look into the future, um, you know, the thing that actually endures forever is the strength of the product. And you know, I used to laugh at the analysts and stuff. They go, you know, oh my God, you know, Zara late to the internet party, H and M are late to the internet party. Well, you know, and you know, now they're there, and guess what? They're massive businesses online because they're very successful businesses offline. So actually, you know, I think the first real advantage is lessened now. I think it really comes down to the quality of the product, the quality of the manufacturing, I mean, you know, the fashionability, the price point. You know, that's where the focus is. Uh, then I think you've got a greater chance to ensure. You know, we've always got a slight dilemma because we've got ASOS, which is a website, ASOS, which is a fashion label as well. But we never sort of dial up one or the other. It's just, it's just ASOS. And actually, you know, the ASOS own brand, I don't know, is about 50% of, of what we sell. So it's a significant part of our business. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm interested in the sustainability of the business. Um, you know, Question. Go, go back to what I, I said about 20 minutes ago. You know, the cost of doing business for Russia is zero. You know, our Russian customers pointed at a Russian translated ASOS shipping from Bath. I have no physical cost in Russia to do business. So, so, so selling to Russians cost me nothing. What I can tell you is that the Russian customs officials are the best dressed. <laughs> 
take out of that what you want. More parcels go missing in Russia than they do in any other. Um, I can tell you that over the last six weeks, you know, Russian sales have gone, have lost six months, have gone backwards. So, you know, we're now 30, 40 percent down year on year in that space in, in Russia, simply because of what's happened with the with the currency. Um, you know, if if I had infrastructure there, I'd be more worried. You know, I don't, so you know, I'm just going to have to ride away. Um, you know, is he going to is he going to sort of produce? Is going to stop Western fashion brands going in there? He can try, but I mean, there's going to be huge upheaval if he if he does that. And actually, the internet is quite a hard one to police on that. Yeah, can, can I answer that in a sort of context of um, just retail generally? You know, I mean, re retail is, if, if anybody is thinking about it as a career, um, you know, it is fascinating because, because it does go through huge change. And, uh, you know, it is the sort of recession barometer, you know, good time to retail, bad time to retail. But, you know, as a sector, it's always been through significant change. You know, it was kind of out of town, then it was small store, then it was big store, then it was, you know, Used to, used to sort of, you know, stuff used to be behind the counter, and it was in front of the counter. That, you know, I mean, it's, it's always kind of. You know, so, so the internet is just another, you know, chapter in the world of retail and, and how, how retail gets done. Actually, you know, the lesson there is that it's not about what's happening in the retail; it's about how you are as a business and how flexible you continue to be. You know, it's businesses that that, that just, you know, don't evolve and don't change. You know, struggle, um, and. In the world of retail, where money is cheap and they get leveraged and they struggle, then that's a double whammy because you know they're paying interest on debt that they shouldn't have had in the first place. And you know, without oversimplifying it, good old John Lewis, you know, which is probably one of the oldest retailers in the UK, but is still today one of the most successful retailers in the UK because they constantly evolve. They're never first. You know, you never hear about John Lewis being first to the internet or you know. But you know what? They're there, and they're really good at what they do, and they just keep evolving and changing. And you know, they're not saddled with debt and all the other bits and pieces. That, that, that. So, so it's really about the mindset of the management and, and the business. And if you can keep changing and evolving, and don't allow yourself to kind of get stuff into a rut, um, is, is the enduring thing. So, challenges galore. The actual challenge is how do you, as a business, keep flexible to keep moving? <laughs> and uh, from the side of the room, so you, yeah. Yeah. So again, I'll do the count below this year. The irony of it is, there isn't a brand or thing I wouldn't want to put on the ASOS back. If I thought about cannibalization, ASOS wouldn't be ASOS. You know, what makes me laugh is I can't, I, I can't see a world where you know, Topshop is happy to sell River Island a new look on its website. Whereas I'm really happy to sell ASOS next to River Island, next to you know, Topshop if they gave it to me, and new look and goodness knows what else. So I, I don't think about cannibalization. I'm thinking about the customer wants it, so provide it. And in that context, marketplace fits with that. You know, I don't. You know, I'm trying to do the, the customer service to give them what they want. I mean, what's more exciting for me in marketplace is we, we kind of we did it because we could see what was happening on eBay. And everybody loves eBay fashion. Um, you know, and actually we sort of started off doing peer to peer and boutiques, and then realised that well, I'm never going to compete on a peer to peer with, with eBay because the, the volumes are so big. But I can compete on sort of boutique side of thing. So now, you know, if you're a young trendy fashion boutique designer, you know, we want you on that platform. And actually, nothing, nothing gives me more pleasure. I've been to see a couple of them. I'm going to sound like a politician now, but, you know, some of these, you know, they're, they're just like you. You know, they, they've got a bit of an eye for fashion. They've set off. Some of these girls are, you know, literally going down markets and buying stuff and putting it to their store or marketplace and, you know, now turning over you know, a couple of hundred thousand pounds. Fantastic. You know, how would they have been able to do that before in the court? In the if they'd have to do it before, it would have been, you know, literally with a market pitch you know, in some, some um, place in the West End. So, um, you know, for me, the opportunity of market is, is phenomenal. I don't see it as cannibalization. I see it as increasing the kind of customer competition. Take a question from the back. Do you, um, you mentioned
mentioned um, the ASOS own brand previously, and how it actually accounts for 50% of the business. At what point in the history of ASOS did you come to the realization that you wanted your own brand out there? And how does it represent 50% of the business? That's really impressive. I'd love to tell you there's some big master strategy. All, all that happened. Um, one of the guys who got out of Arcadia, Rob Breedy, who was kind of the, the next big retailer person who got after Lorry, um, you know, he was there. He said, well, look, you know, we're selling all these brands. Why don't we do our own brand? Why don't we do our own brand? And actually, you know, what we were doing for some of the brands, all, all the, not all the brands we sold were recognizable. I mean, you can literally, there are a bunch of wholesalers, you know, in the UK uh, whose brands aren't recognizable. Because there, there were no Lipsy as a brand. So Lipsy was a brand that was, all, that was almost founded on the back of ASOS 10, 14 years ago. You know, we were selling it but then as an unknown brand. It was just, it was just a wholesaler in the, in the, in the West End. Um, and then it became a brand. So all we did, we, 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 we would buy stuff from these wholesalers and just put an ASOS badge in it. It was as simple as that. And then as part of that, we would go, okay, well now we can start to design our own label. So we employed a designer who came from Selfridge, uh, and that started the whole sort of own brand. But, but the art, you know, I think part of our success actually is, is to think about what we do is, is no different to what the fashion high street has done for hundreds of years. We just put the internet front on it. So all the people we employ are from the likes of Topshop and Selfridge and New Look and River Island, all of whom are used to doing own brand product. So actually it was really natural for us to kind of do that because everybody we employed, that was their, that was their skill set anyway. So it was no big master strategy and it just turned out like, and the reason it's such a big chunk of the business, if you think about a store, you know, any store, doesn't matter how big it is, could be the size of the room or, or quarter the size of the room, the number of options that they have are determined by the size of the space. There's no point in trying to fill a you know, small store with 20,000 dresses. So you know, they will only ever make 15, 20 dresses to fill the space. So any physical brand, the, size, the width of the inventory is always determined by the size of the space they're trying to fill. With us, we've got rubber walls. You know, without stores, we just have a bloody great big warehouse. So actually our own brand product, in terms of number of options, is huge. Because we've never had to have it you know, determined by a physical store. And you know, we couldn't 
exploit that in a way that we now can. So as we grew internationally, things that are important to trade as a retailer, like the ability to uh, have different prices in different territories, the ability to be able to promote different in certain territories, you know, all that kind of stuff, which is perfectly normal, our systems were not built to designed to do that. So we've been through a really painful process of having to unbundle everything we've ever done and rebuild it effectively to be, do it on the international basis. Now that was fine when everything was working in our favour and international sales were growing. Unfortunately, the UK economy recovered considerably quicker than any of us envisaged. And on the back of that, sterling increased quicker than any of us envisaged, which suddenly meant that my dress, the price of my dress in Australia, was suddenly looking completely out of kilter what it looked like even you know, 12 months earlier. So that's when our international sales started to grow quite dramatically. And the levers I needed to change that, i.e. the ability to reprice it, I didn't have, I didn't have that technical capability. So that's where we had a bit of a wobble 12 months ago. And unfortunately, sterling increased and my capability doing about it kind of crossed over. And I was, you know, the old expression, the tide went out, I was, I had my trousers were in my ankles. So, but now that's fixed. And now we've got that technical capability. The first thing we're doing is lowering the price in all those markets now, where sterling has made us more expensive. And whoosh, sales are coming back. So, so yeah, I had, a, I had a, not the best 12 months last year, but I think we're through that. And uh, right in the corner. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I will try my best regarding my voice. Um, so because I'm far away. So you were mentioning um, Asus as a media brand before, um, and I know that you have quite a big YouTube presence regarding uh, content marketing. So like branded video content. What do you think of that? Strategy is it important for you? Yeah. So, so there's there's kind of two things in in the world now, isn't it? There's you know, there's the excitement around new media and and uh, you know the demise of traditional media, should we say? So I get that. I don't think it's the right passage for everybody. I mean, we're really fortunate. You know, we're we're in the young fashion space. Um, you know, we're talking to people who are who are warm to what we're trying to tell them. I mean, fashion inspiration, fashion advice, celebrities wearing X, Y, Z. I mean, you know, that, that's rich material from a, a kind of media standpoint. You know, our view is a simple one. We will spend the best part of 40 odd million quid with Google this year. You know, that's a big old check to write. So basically, every time you're searching for stuff, to try and entice you into ASOL. Could I at some point spend 40 million pounds producing amazing content, fashion rich, inspirational content that is going to you know, enrich your lives and, in, in, and give me a bigger brand on the back of it, yeah. So, so the journey for me is, you know, I'd love Google to this point, it's got us there, but it, you know, going forward, would I rather spend more money building my brand as opposed to paying somebody else to get people to the map? Well, I'd rather do that. So fortunately, we're already quite a long way down that journey. We've got <coughs> and we do a lot of other content, but I actually want to really build out the ASOS media brand you know, as a marketing tool. And, you know, on the back of that, you'll get more of what you want, and hopefully, you know, we'll get more of what we want in the process. And there'll definitely be jobs. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so. Everybody's very polite. Pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
No, I think I've got a good balance. Now, yeah, thank you very much for asking. <laughs> uh, and it, well, it wasn't always like that, but actually we had so much fun doing it. it kind of never felt like somebody who's going to take the plug, right? And um, I don't want to discredit some of the brands that we had in the early stages, but actually, you know, some of the, the first brand, the second brand to sign up, uh, I can remember them actually, they were uh, Bench, uh, Box Fresh, uh, 